Welcome to the PBD Research Seminar. Uh, this is the last one of the semester. Uh, and next semester, we'll probably have Harry Richardson, Richard Green, uh, Rayfield Bostic, and some other of our faculty speaking in the fall. And in the spring, Chris Redfern and two of our new faculty. Um, oh my God, I can't think right now. Anyway. As you know, the way the PD research seminar is that I distribute the uh, papers ahead of time. We read them, and then we begin with a commentator, who, and then response from the author, and finally, uh, yeah, finally, actually soon, we hope, comments from and questions from the audience. Um, our speaker today, our uh, the paper today is written by Assistant Professor Elizabeth Currett whose work on essentially the geography of reputation and style and fashion is fairly important and well recognized. And our speaker today, our commentator, is Professor Leo Brody, a university professor and uh, chair professor of English, who has written a book, what was it, 10 years ago? Uh, almost, 20. almost 20 years ago, called more The Prince. More than 20? 23. Oh my god. <laughs> Uh, called The Frenzy of Renown, and uh, which is about the nature of fame, in, and more recently has written a book on masculinity, and is one of the most distinguished faculty members at the university. Leo will begin, and then uh, Elizabeth will pick up. Right? Okay. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'm really happy to be here and to be able to comment on Elizabeth's paper, and it was fascinating. Uh, and, um, I think you should also take these comments as the comments uh, of, of an outsider. Pardon me, yes. Yeah, okay. We only have one mic, okay. so. Okay. 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 It's it's sound. So you should definitely have No, I'll move it, I'll move it over to you. <laughs> I think it'll pick up. Okay. The sound check. Okay. Uh, these are the comments. I mean, in many ways, I'm an outsider um, to your field here. Yeah, I'm not familiar with many of the cited authorities or the prior studies or even some of the disciplinary terms of art. There, but still um, coming at this, um, fascinated with the topic and coming at it from my own particular perspective. The book that Martin mentioned, The Frenzy of Renown, uh, Fame and Its History, it was actually a historical study trying to see how fame changes uh, culturally and historically over the millennia beginning, or way back, beginning with Alexander the Great and coming down to Hitler and Judy Garland. Okay, so uh, I try not to do anybody who was alive. And I think it's uh, fascinating to try to deal with people who are alive in situations, living in immediate situations there, although I think they raise their own kinds of problems there. And I must say, innovative use of uh, data by, by Elizabeth and her co-author there, this unique data set is fascinating, the effort to create or discover patterns where there are otherwise only seemingly disparate, unconnected events. And using this archive of the Getty images uh, and this, this is the whole process, I think, raises some questions that strike me about the thrust of the paper, some of which I hope will be useful and others may not be. Um, I think, you know, this whole this search for kind of social agglomerations there where these events are taste-driven and so the need to bring together people to establish conventions to create buzz, which then hopefully motivates consumption in some way, uh, is, is an important uh, area of study there. But I wonder whether buzz does have any um, significant relationship to premeditated institutional settings. That is, I think buzz as a term, uh, perhaps, and this is something that I hadn't thought about until reading the paper, you know, needs to be differentiated in some ways. Is, is buzz really what is created by someone who says, here is a place where buzz is happening, like the Kodak Theater? Uh, or is the really significant buzz a kind of willful creation of an audience that then rises? And that is buzz top down, or is buzz bottom up? Uh, and this, these kinds of uh, questions occur to me because the, there's so much, I think, in our time, uh, particularly premedit premeditated creation of cultural centers in order to perpetuate buzz, in order to create a kind of economics of buzz. Uh, sometimes, I, because of writing that fame book, I get uh, called up by people about anything that happens, virtually anything that I got called up yesterday about the Sullenberger and Phillips, you know, the captain, the, the airplane, the guy who brought the airplane down and the, uh, the captain who was rescued. You know, are they famous? Are they celebrities? What are, are they really heroes? Like I don't always ask these questions and finally it comes down to uh, why are we obsessed with fame? 
and I say, well, I'm not sure we are, but certainly you are, that in the, the media is obsessed with fame. There's a kind of self-perpetuating uh, process there. You know, as far as we consumers of fame are concerned, we can often take it or leave it. Sometimes we're very involved, sometimes we're ignoring it entirely. So part of the problem, I think, is whether something is buzzworthy is how is it related to a mass market? How, is it, how does it actually uh, impact the, um, you know, the consumer, us? Uh, how many times have we seen Hollywood excited about a film? How many times have we seen a flood of ads and events heralding this new great film only to see it fall flat on its face uh, at the box office? Uh, Hollywood, uh, in terms of creating, and I think this is true of any kind of buzz situation, that is, they're playing on past performance, on past genres, on past ways that, that buzz was created. Uh, but perhaps these genres, these forms, these events are no longer interesting uh, to the audience. Perhaps these latest versions are not as compelling as the earlier ones. So it's something that, that, that again, Elizabeth mentions in the, in the uh, essay about the ambiguity uh, of attaining value in cultural goods. And maybe that's, I'm coming from the ambiguous, ambiguous side, you're coming more from the from the archival and the factual side of this. You know, can we actually um, quantify something? Uh, there's also, I think, another intriguing issue, which is the lack of causality uh, in, in buzz. I mean, there, is, there may be buzz, but then what does it mean there? Uh, it has no necessary relationship to value, uh, let alone quality, cultural need, or, or even uh, continuity. I mean, that is just because there is buzz at a particular moment doesn't mean there's going to be buzz about the same thing next week. <coughs> Anyone, just as an example of this, anybody can become famous if they have money and a good publicist, but uh, they can't necessarily remain famous. That is, you have to keep that going in some way. You have to somehow connect with an audience, connect with a cultural moment, uh, or whatever it is there. If you're just trying to, uh, you know, just trying to get your name in the paper, that's easy enough to do. But by the next day, the paper is gone and your name is gone as well. Uh, so maybe at least a crude distinction might be made between what I would call pump priming buzz, that is when publicists or city governments uh, or whoever <coughs> is together and say this is going to be a buzz place, uh, and buzz that has legs there, uh, which is really, again, something that's, that's connected to the audience and how the audience works there. Um, uh, just moving on to another aspect of the um, of uh, the paper there, the focus on places, I would, I would question or wonder about, too. Uh, these are places and um, you know, picked at a particular time and place so that the archive of the Getty Images could be used properly uh, and effectively there. But I would ask, you know, how do places change? Why are they chosen to begin with? Who is choosing them? There's a, kind of, there's a certain kind of chicken and egg problem here that the Getty Images says, OK, we're sending out these photographers to this place because this is going to be a buzzworthy occasion. And then you, in a sense, document the fact that people do go to this occasion. Um, and also, uh, I think that we mentioned in the paper that, uh, in fact, people can self-nominate uh, events as buzzworthy, too. So I mean, there is a kind of circularity here that I, I think uh, needs to be investigated, and perhaps one way of investigating it, uh, certainly my, my sort of inclination in this, would be to look at it a little bit uh, historically as well. How do places change? You know, how do the significant places, let's say, in the major cities change? Or how do some major some cities all of a, all of a sudden become major uh, because of things happening? And why, you know, the Beats go to San Francisco in the 40s and 50s, and all of a sudden San Francisco means something that it didn't quite mean uh, before. Uh, how do places change? How, um, why are they chosen to begin with? Uh, where did some centers start? What happened, let's say, when, when New York decided to create Lincoln Center, which is obviously a model for, you know, for our own music center there, too. The idea of, of a city saying somehow the government, the cultural people, whoever it is in the city, the philanthropist, uh, saying that what we really need is to centralize culture rather than having it happen here or there. You know, I mean, how does that come in? What stage, let's say, in urban development uh, might that respond to? Uh, is there any analogy, let's say, between that and what uh, Baron Osman uh, did with the Grand Boulevards in Paris and you know, with the opera as, as one of the intersections of the Grand Boulevards and the Salle Playal and other, other kinds of theaters there that were connected in a way by those boulevards that perhaps were not uh, as easily accessible uh, before that? Uh, the Globe Theater, the Curtain Theater, and the Swan Theater are all there on the South Bank. Why are they there? Because the city fathers, you know, the authorities in London didn't want them in London. 
So they just got as close to London as possible. That was kind of a happenstance thing that, that became the theatrical center. Uh, I'd also say it would be interesting to talk about the um, places that are premeditated in that way but don't work there. Um, I'm thinking of Hollywood and Highland, uh, which didn't work for a long time uh, and was you know, sold um, finally for a, uh, a fraction of what it cost to build there. I mean, nobody was going there. Now, finally, the Kodak Theater has sort of become a site, but it's a site, let's say, only a couple times a year. Uh, and the, the problem, one of the problems with Hollywood and the Highland uh, was that it was merely a top-down place, and it didn't have any connection to the neighborhood. You know, people in the neighborhood didn't go to the shop, they didn't go to the restaurants. It was only for tourists in that way, only premeditated for tourists. And so it had a lot of problems in that way. So this whole question of, of place, I think, uh, is, is intriguing uh, as well to me. In the, in the article. Um, another, another aspect is I think, again, by focusing on place and by focusing on these particular venues there, uh, it's a kind of centripetal uh, situation. And I would, I would ask for a little more of the centrifugal uh, in this, too, uh, connected to this whole question of how taste or buzz change. And I, I mean the centrifugal, I think, let's say, uh, even in terms of the internet and the kind of decentering of buzz, the, the undermining of a, of a physical place where it has to be and the rise, let's say, of this, of this virtual place where things can happen. Um, buzz, again, another kind of differentiation then. That is, is it buzz about uh, human bodies in certain specific uh, centralized spaces uh, or is it something else? Is it, you know, is it, is it a kind of uh, mental, almost a mental kind of new uh, that creates a kind of word of mouth that you know, we call buzz there. Uh, I, I noticed a couple times in the paper, actually, it was repeated a few times, so it made me wonder if there might be some uneasy, uneasiness on your part uh, about it, that you weren't considering uh, uh, the subculture, the creative class, or, or bohemia. And you mentioned it so many times, yeah. I thought this was kind of bothering you. Well, we're viewer one, two, and three uh, had yeah. a problem, so uh -huh. we need to make the case for what Getty's point was. Yeah. That's, that's it. We are uneasy about that. Okay, well, that's, and that would, I would uh, connect that to what I was calling the centrifugal before too. That is, you know, what uh, I would think, let's say, of the movement of art galleries in Los Angeles over the past 20 years or so. You know, they used to be on La Cien well, in La Cienega and they had these opening nights. Then rents got too high, so they moved to Santa Monica uh, there. And then rents got too high there, so they moved to Bergamot Station. And then Chongqing Road also started uh, in Chinatown. So you have all these different kinds of foci. Uh, for cultural events that you know that have factors you know like I mean, kind of tangible factors there and how they move and and so and you know it would be intriguing let's say I mean this is like talking about art you could say the same thing about jazz clubs or other kinds of uh, you know less grandiose events there I also wonder if if there's some differentiation um, uh, to be made between uh, events that are sort of um, career oriented let's say for the participants uh, like the opening of a movie, and, and events that may have some relation to career but are also uh, connected to um, uh, kind of self-enhancement by charity events. I mean, is there some distinction between, between those kinds of events that, that might be uh, useful there? Uh, I think, and you talked about uh, inorganic event places versus organic mm -hmm. event places, but I think it's an interesting distinction there too. And I would say, I mean, that's sort of, I, I would say that's analogous to what I was talking about top down and, and bottom up uh, events too. <coughs> that there's something rising because it's a need, it, it meets a need uh, that people have in there, or is it something that, that some bureaucratic group uh, is, says, okay, this is where we're going to have culture, and this is, you know, this is where culture is going to happen, and this is where you're going to have to go for culture. There. Not that not that these can't cross over in some way and become uh, naturalized. Let's say I mean <coughs> people think let's say the music center or Lincoln Center, even though it was premeditated, you know it's now become a space that that, uh, that people like to go to. There. So I would I guess I would sort of question too um, when you say at one point uh, uh, page thirty five I think it is that media had an unintentional effect <coughs> on city development and place identity. I, perhaps that was true in the past, although I'm not sure, but it certainly doesn't seem to be true now. That it's the need of media to centralize their own, their own electronic, their own technology, and to have a place of suits. I mean, why did the, why did the Academy Awards change from the Shrine um, to the Kodak? You know, the Shrine's too small, they couldn't really get the TV in there, they couldn't do the special effects, uh, things like that. I don't know, maybe USC didn't want the parking problem, who knows, or all the other factors. 
but I mean, it certainly seems to me that that part of part of the um, centralization uh, that that you point to, uh, you know, Hollywood Boulevard, Sunset Boulevard, Broadway uh, in New York, is really does is very much serving media needs uh, in that way. So. Um, that, I mean, I, I think that's, you know, the media is driving us uh, there. And, and finally, um, I would uh, just say something just about the, in terms of the consumption, just the kind of individual consumption there. Um, and I, this, uh, again, with somebody, uh, one of your uh, authorities, one of your, uh, that you cite there, uh, is it Ebers, is that the name? Oh, long, the long tail. The long tail. Challenging the long tail. Right, yeah. right. And something about how we are all social folks, and so we like to uh, consume culture socially there, too, you know, as a kind of, and it always gets me nervous when people say we. Right. Uh, in, in that way, that, uh, you know, that somehow we're all the same here. But it does seem to me that sometimes we're social folks, and sometimes we're not right. social folks. You know, sometimes we like to be in audiences, and sometimes we like to be alone. Uh, and so the you know the the need for uh, particular kinds of physical spaces, uh, I think, is, is a really interesting question. And the uh, the effort to uh, centralize those spaces too, I mean, kind of line them all up uh, within a certain particular area within a city, uh, is interesting. But I think there are all sorts of other questions here um, that I think would, that would be fascinating to go into as well. And I'll end. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, what do we need? Skip the microphone over to the Do whatever you need to do. Oh, okay. <laughs> you said no. Excuse me, I'm, I'm uh, distributing uh, cookies, but our respondent now will be Elizabeth Kurt, and she will talk about Leo's comments, and then we'll open it up to questions from all of you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Martin. So first of all, I just want to thank Leo Brody. I mean, I can't tell you what an honor this is. I've been such a fan of your work forever. So this is just amazing to be able to sit here and have you give me all of your advice on something that you're probably the world's expert on. So um, first of all, uh, I wanted to say that. Um, second of all, you have covered so many things about my paper. I just, I don't even know where to begin. But um, you have highlighted what I think are um, I guess I'll start with some of the things you've highlighted that I think are very um, important in terms of what I wanted to go along or get across with my colleague uh, in our paper. Um, first is this tension between commodified culture, what Getty measures, which is a market-driven data set. These photographers need to sell their photos to make a living. And Bohemia, uh, which often historically have run against one another. Um, in fact, you know, the minute the graffiti artists know that photographers are showing up, they're out of there. Um, the minute the neighborhood is um, flooded with investment bankers, the artists move to another one. Um, some of this is just pure economics that real estate values go up, and some of it's simply the difference between what bohemia and symbolic artistic production means and, and what uh, commodified culture means. So I think that is the sort of larger context of which we've answered maybe the commodified element, but the bohemia is still up to grabs. And, and part of it is um, inherent in bohemia, which is that they don't want their pictures taken. It's a really hard data set. So what, what we hope we are doing with this data set is, is telling a story that um, the pattern we have found may be universal, even if the data set is not, in the sense that if we have a finite number of, of event enclaves is what we call them. If we know that these industries tend to run up against one another, is that a larger story um, of how social dynamics happen uh, in cultural production? And then by extension, can we say, well, we know that technology in Silicon Valley had the same kinds of qualities. So are we learning something about social agglomerations uh, and that this data set gives us one lens into it? The second thing that I think Professor Brody brought up that's very important is the recursive mechanism here. The fact that one, uh, that the media and cultural production uh, is mutually beneficial. Uh, the media on some level, uh, even if it keeps the cultural producers on tender hooks because they want their pictures taken and to perpetuate celebrity, the image is so important. On the other hand, they don't have jobs if they don't have something to write about. And so there's this dynamic which is implicit in perhaps why we see the concentration. So um, 
for particularly for a market driven uh, data set for these photographs, uh, the media depends on a regular money shot. So you may be able to, as a paparazzi or a pap, show up uh, in Echo Park and possibly get a picture of Kristen Dunst, the actress, stumbling out of a bar at 2 a.m. But you really will get a picture of Kristen Dunst or Angelina Jolie if you show up at the Kodak Theater. And so there is this sort of economy of scale and risk aversion that is, is also built into why we see these hubs, which is that there's a guarantee of getting a picture taken of you, and there's a guarantee of uh, a photographer getting a picture that they can sell. Uh, so I think that that's an interesting uh, dynamic that's going on. And I, I, I you know, uh, uh, Professor Gordy brings up something really important, which is what is the causality here? Um, is it top down that the celebrities or the cultural producers show up in X location and then the media follows? Or does the media make decisions about where they want to take pictures and the celebrities show up there? Um, I do not have the answer to that question. Um, I'm trying to, I'm talking to people in these worlds about why they take pictures of where they do. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, some people that I've been, I've been talking to um, for my larger product project, which is my book, is, is um, celebrity tabloids. And um, talking to them about their network that they have with their photographers. Now, they are not Getty image photographers, they are paparazzi who are just relentlessly you know, tracking down actors and actresses. But what you find is there's this network where there is sources calling so and so, gentlemen's agreements, where if um, a magazine gives a phone call to a paparazzi and says, you should show up at X restaurant, Tom Cruise is going to leave it, um, that the paparazzi who shows up there does always give. Um, that magazine, the right of first refusal. None of this is signed, of course, which is the interesting kind of social agreements that they have. I think the other thing that this gets to is the larger question in the field of studying uh, art and culture, which is the ambiguity of taste and value. Uh, this is the question that I initially set out to study um, when I did my first research in New York and I, I interviewed artists and fashion designers and musicians. Um, I was always like, well, how do we understand which artists become stars and which don't? And, and what do we mean by a star? Are you revered in the bohemian subculture, or are you Damien Hirst and people write books about you? Uh, and it, the problem is, is that art culture is subjective. Uh, and so uh, if Getty measures the global marketplace, uh, what it really does is it distributes information about some cultural producers and cultural events and not others. And in that way, it not even implicitly, quite explicitly, um, determines which cultural producers are valued more on the larger marketplace. Another thing that I think was very, very important um, that Professor Brody brought up, which is the ephemeral nature of it all. Uh, and so we, we spent about, oh god, six months cleaning up this data set uh, with our research assistants. And we were genuinely nervous, because we, we thought to ourselves, if we run this analysis and we come up with meaningless data, oh god, what are we going to do? Um, so it was very, uh, it was great relief and very exciting for us when we came up with something that we thought was interesting. But what we realized is that this is a pilot study. And the thing that's very important is to actually look at dates before 2006, 2007, and dates after, and also other cities, and see if the patterns are similar. Because of course, the celebrity and the cultural event, events are part of a zeitgeist. We care about X actor and actress or artist now. We don't as much five years from now. Their photo ma matters more now than it does later. Um, and so the ephemeral nature of buzz and celebrity uh, is, of course, packed into it. But do we see, as social scientists, a larger pattern of how these social views are organized, how the media interacts with these social events? Um, that's, I think, the larger question for us. Um, the photos we collect now, of course, many ways depreciate in value after they're taken. Um, the historical context is a very, very important one. Uh, and, and the idea of why does the Kodak Theater become an iconic place or not? Um, why do we always have pictures taken of, of important events at the Guggenheim? In some ways, it's very obvious. It's like, well, these are art museums. These are places where the Oscars are held. On the other hand, there is clearly a sort of, uh, you know, Monday morning quarterback element to this, in the sense that there are initial conditions which are largely arbitrary, uh, and that they, but that they are extraordinarily path dependent. So, if enough stuff happens in some place, 
that means more of that stuff is going to happen there. Um, what the initial moment was uh, is, is hard, it's hard to predict. Um, but what we do know is that it reinforces itself. In fact, you know, if you um, look at sort of which places rise as event enclaves, they don't, it's not just that they're greater, they are disproportionately more important to the media. Um, way more so, and they also exhibit spillover effects, which is that you have this disproportionate enclave and then all of these nodes around it. And so places become just more important. Now, the, the bigger intellectual question here, I think, or, or exploration, is that we see this all the time in lots of different things. I mean, this is a story about the media, celebrity, and cultural production, but it's also a story about Silicon Valley, and it's a story about Hollywood, that we see dominance of particular places for reasons that post facto we can say, well, it was that semiconductors got an edge in Silicon Valley, or Frederick Terman kept people around, and we can say the same thing about the Kodak Theater. Well, it was built and it was amenable to this, and USC didn't want the Oscars nearby. So we can sort of retell the story, but, but the point is the same, that you have this universal recursive mechanism occurring. Um, one thing which I don't know, and I'd be, I'd be very interested in what everyone else uh, here has to say about it, is in a day and age of technology, how much does place matter? I, I think it matters more than ever. I think that images require place. Uh, I think that celebrity, even if you have buzz on the <coughs> internet, uh, we care about celebrities because they are relentlessly documented. We can follow their lives. and so that means place does matter, but it, it, it does put into question how much uh, the internet and the placelessness of distributing this information uh, counts in this story. The fact that Getty Images now is not just a once a week in some sort of, in, in, in People magazine, but it's on Perez Hilton and it's on Getty's website, and so you have all of this instant information about these events. Um, something else that, uh, was, was important, and I think is a tension here, is the difference between the career-motivated and the self-enhancement events. And I may be being a cynic here, but I, I definitely come from the Bourdieu school of conniving, that in, 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 in subjective industries, not even in just subjective industries, even in, I'm sure, Silicon Valley, and certainly you see this in academic conferences, um, where the tension between the informal, we're just hanging out, and the I've got my feelers out for the people I need to talk to and to mobilize my career is always on. It is more profound in cultural industries because they are so subjective. And running into Anna Wintour as a fashion designer means a lot. Um, and so even if you run into her while you're grabbing a coffee, um, it can have a tremendous impact on your career. So I, I actually don't know if there's a distinction. I think that these worlds of informal uh, self-enhancement versus the career mobilization are constantly running up against each other. And this is not to say anyone's comfortable with that. Um, the other ultimate question that in cultural industries besides the uh, how do we determine taste is who's determining taste, okay? And so Professor Brody brought up something very important, which is, okay, are we as the media um, rising to a need um, that the public has signaled, or are we feeding the masses? Um, who is telling who what's important? Who is the real gatekeeper? Uh, again, it depends who you, whose work you study, um, which side you're on on this. Um, let's see if there's any other uh, points here. So uh, another thing that uh, my colleague and I are very interested in is uh, another data set which is much less uh, systematically cataloged, but that is the paparazzi that are following not just the, uh, form, the formal events that count, but the actual celebrity sightings, which we believe probably operate very similar. similarly. You still have these economies of scale, you still have these informal nodes, everyone gets a coffee at X location. You know, if you're talking about some Hollywood starlet, she has a choice to get her coffee at the coffee bean and tea leaf on Fairfax, or she can get it in some obscure place. If she does decide to go to coffee bean, she knows what she's up to. She knows that the paps are there and they're gonna take pictures of her. Um, these, we, we are interested in whether or not the informal dynamics of these worlds, as much as the events that count, like the Oscars or the Grammys, if they have similar kinds of uh, dynamics. Um, 
So anyway, that's enough for me. Uh, so thank you very much for listening to us, and thank you again, Professor Brody. This is really an honor. So. Yeah, just just a couple points. I, you know, I think uh, what Elizabeth was saying was fascinating in terms of you know just kind of the focus of, of the work. Uh, just a couple comments here. Uh, when you were saying in, in the day and age of technology, does place matter? And I think it does matter. But the, you know, the question I would raise is, what does place mean? Has place changed its meaning uh, in some sense? Uh, and that uh, even in the virtual world, and, you know, I, I just raised this question. I was, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, the woman in, uh, on you know, YouTube when Britons have talent with Simon and everything. That where she comes out and sings this, you know, looks totally unrelated to anything resemble what we think resembles a singer, you know, a good singer, and comes out and does this tremendous uh, uh, song from from Leighton Is. And I was just wondering, uh, just in thinking about that, do we need to know? First of all, in terms of place, where are they? Well, they're probably in Britain somewhere. But we don't know. I mean, but on the other hand, what makes place for that? And I think part of it is to have an audience. That is, would it be as effective if it were all, uh, if it were just that woman singing by herself? There, I mean, she needs to have the audience of the judges, and then she needs to have the audience, and all you know, so many of the reaction shots from the audience, people being amazed at it. I mean, it kind of anchors it in that sense. Uh, so it's there. There is a virtual definition of place that you know that might be usefully explored here too. And I guess, and this is also related to place too. And I put your comment about the nature of the culture industries was really, uh, you know, right on, right on there. That um, I think, uh, perhaps in general, uh, you know, the, the, the largest generalization we can make in terms of this is that in all the cultural industries, there's always this urge for anchoring of some sort. Now, whether that anchoring is in place or is in a photograph or something like that, uh, is, is, it just, I think it's because of that evanescent nature of fame and buzz and uh, the abstract quality of what we're talking about. You know, what is the product here? You know, it's some kind of charisma, is it some kind of aura there? And so how does that get anchored? Um, and one way of anchoring it is, you know, is by taking a picture of the people and by having, uh, you know, particular venues that, that they will appear in. Uh, so there's this abstract side to the nature of fame and, and buzz in general. And I was th in general, and I was thinking, let's say, of the of the idea of Hollywood and Vine. You know, that, that Hollywood and Vine, you know, the center of Hollywood. Well, you know, everybody who's been to Hollywood and Vine knows it's nothing. You know, you know, it's a couple of buildings on the cross street there. But this was first. It came out of radio. You know, it came out of radio because they were always talking because the broadcasting was from Hollywood and Vine. And so it came out of the ear rather than the eye. It was connected to the ear rather than the eye. So it had that kind of invisible aura to it. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm doing a, a, a little book now on the Hollywood sign. And uh, you know, this idea, you know, I go up in the park and I see, you know, people are always, take, are always taking pictures of the Hollywood sign. They're always taking pictures of themselves with the Hollywood sign. And I think the Hollywood sign itself is exactly that kind of anchor. You know, I was actually there in Hollywood, so I have to take a what else do you take a picture of? Do you take a picture of the front of the Pantages? Or, no. Do you take a picture of the Kodak Theater? No. You take a picture of the Hollywood sign. And I think in its abstractness and its, you know, its kind of placeness there, it is that exactly that, that kind of anchor that, that we're talking about in, in other ways. But let's well, open this up. Uh, first of all, Elizabeth has given us uh, some cards with uh, pictures from her exhibit. And so uh, please take some. I'm sure there's enough for everybody to have one at least, if not more. And they're really quite lovely. And uh, let me start the questions. Anybody? By the way, thank you both. It was a wonderful interchange. It justifies our format. Um, no, I, that's important. Uh, any questions? <coughs> yes. I, have, I have a whole bunch of questions. So um, I'm going to fall into a bunch of different categories. So, all right, uh, so first thing is get my head around what buzz is. Okay, so is Buzz really about uh, cultural activities, or is it about, I mean, could you do this on civil disobedience? Right, because, you know, protests start in some places, not other places, right? And so, what is, is it about social capital that allows Berkeley to be this place where people come who select into this? So there's no, and I'm kind of wondering what your larger lesson from this is. I mean, I think it's really interesting by itself, but is there something larger about the agglomeration of social activity in some way? So, civil disobedience, I think about, I think about, uh, you know, these three-on-three three basketball games that occur in the inner city that are credible because they have street cred for what a legitimate basketball game is. And then Nike comes and finds them, and then tournaments spring up. And there's, a, there's this interaction between legitimate, not bohemia, but in this case, street cred in some other form. And I'm kind of wondering whether you have some larger story in mind about 
all of these things sort of fitting in a larger framework, where Buzz is one of them. You're looking at celebrity, but you could equally look well. I mean, I think civil disobedience is one that would be interesting to study because it has different incentives at the end of it. With Buzz, you've got profit. Everyone's looking to make some money here. But with civil disobedience, you know, why, does, why do riots start someplace and other places? Why do gatherings, why do movements start? I mean, all those things have the same sort of social fabric nest to them, right? So why did some, I mean, you know, I just think there's a, I'm just kind of curious about that, that kind of question. I'll, I'll start there, I'll ask more later. But. Well, uh, that's a great question. Uh, what I, I mean, obviously my agenda is art and culture and celebrity. Um, but I think that the study of buzz is really the study of, of, of a couple of things. I think it's a study of signaling yeah. um, what uh, what should consumers of culture pay attention to over other things? I think it is also uh, more generally a study of agglomeration. In that respect, you're on to something. So, um, there, you know, initially it looks like there's no linkage between civil disobedience, uh, you, know, you know, ad hoc uh, spontaneous basketball games happening in some places and not others, uh, and uh, the Oscars. But you're right that some places seem to become nodes and others don't. Um, the cause and effect, again, I don't know the answer to, but the important thing is that you're right, there is this larger thing that's unifying these disparate activities. I think, you know, I would, I would also say that, um, you know, back to what I was uh, mentioning about, uh, you know, sometimes we want to do things with other people, or, and sometimes you want to do things alone, and but also sometimes you want to do things that everybody has heard of, and other times you want to do things that nobody else or very few other people have heard of, you know. And so we need to, you know, that, that kind of uh, on the one we want to be our own cultural mavens, you know, uh, and on one in one guise, and then in other guys we want to, you know, be there with the crowd too. So I mean, I think those different kinds of, of um, you know, almost psychological pressures there uh, lead us to be. And you know, and I think in a you know, as society gets more and more quantitatively and qualitatively huge um, and disparate, there, we're also looking for ways of differentiating. You know, what are we going to do? It's Saturday night. What are you going to do? I mean, you're going to go to the you're going to go to the movie that everybody says is the great new movie, or you're going to go to some little odd thing that you can tell people about the next day that they haven't seen yet. Too. So I mean, there's there's this kind of um, Almost like you know the dousing rod of culture. You know, like how are you going to find what you're going to do? You're going to go to right. this rod, and and so many of these things are, are also. I mean, you know, people resist the premeditated part too. It's too big. Oh, that's you know that's the big blockbuster movie, or um, you know I'm just thinking the um, you know this thing that's on uh, now uh, that the uh, you know, Republicans want everybody to send a tea bag. <laughs> right into uh, into Obama or something because of the Boston Tea Party or something, you know. There's I was in the gym and I was watching, you know, and CNN had this big map of the U.S. So it's like one of your maps almost, like where all these tea parties were taking place, you know. So I mean, again, it's like is this premeditated? Is this you know imposed? It's obviously imposed. You know, it's kind of organized in that way. But then when it's presented as a map, it sort of says, oh, are you? You know, sort of like it's the contrast between, you know, be the first on your block on one hand, or everybody else is doing it, why aren't you? Yeah. So. Yeah. Can I ask another one then? Uh, mm -hmm. No, I'll, I'll get that one <laughs> <Okay>. first. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, let me ask one to, uh, I'll call it the buzz off question, <laughs> which is the following. Um, the most interesting to me is all the failures of attempt to establish those centers. Um, your causal question, you know, what causes this, disappear, doesn't become an interesting question if you have agglomeration effects, where essentially you have a random possibility of things fail because they don't bloom. You know, sort of evolutionary theory. It's not that anything was wrong with it, it just didn't get two of them or four of them. But have you thought much about buzz, off buzz, I guess you would call it? You mean the, the fact that for every star and every star location that there's a hundred that didn't do it. Yeah, you know, it's something like that. A study of it sort of, as they say, the uh, flame apps. Well, that's what I'm trying to write about right now, Mark. Really? So yeah. tell us more. <laughs> um, I do think there seems to be uh, mechanisms by which places are more successful than others and people are more successful than others. Um, certainly if you look at the individual level at artists or designers, there are the professionalization the ability to manage a business 
uh, is the thing that makes them stars. And that sounds so boring, but it's true. Uh, if you look at any big star uh, cultural producer, they often have a businessman next to them. They have someone, if you look at Mark Jacobs, if you look at Ralph Lauren, that these are people who look at it as a business. Because, and this isn't very hard to dissect here. Um, if you're the most successful graffiti artist in New York, that's great, but that's a real kind of relative concept. Um, if you're talking about a global marketplace, you need to sell stuff. You need to move units, or you need to be written up, or whatever it is, and that does require involving yourself in the market, and, and an inability to do that is your first um, kind of failure. On the other hand, I do believe uh, that there's an amazing amount of arbitrariness. I mean, this is, and this actually gets back to the more general discussion of economic development, which is, you know, why do some places fail and some don't? You can right. say, well, Los Angeles has great weather. Well, you know, so do lots of parts of southern United States. Of what makes LA work? What makes New York City work despite being brutal and congested and dense? These are, you know, if I if I knew the answer to these questions, you know, I I think I'd be I don't know maybe I'd win the Nobel Prize or something because maybe I think that like there's Neil's chair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I don't know. That might still be tough, but but it's true though. I mean, it is it is a larger question, and I, I honestly think that the initial conditions are the arbitrary part. The more uh, interesting thing, at least to me, is that. Um, the perpetuation. How do, if you do get some initial advantage, whether as a place or as an individual, um, what are the mechanisms by which you are able to keep it so that you execute in some, on some level a lock-in? Even if, you know, as a celebrity, your lock-in is five years. But, you know, as a place, as, as the Kodak Theater or as Silicon Valley, your lock-in can be a much longer trajectory. And so what are those mechanisms in which that happens? And, and um, you know, in, in my first book, in the Warhol book, I attempted to look at this by, um, by looking at, well, first of all, you have networking, which is a very basic thing people talk about, but it's very meaningful. If people feel like they can get lots of jobs in one place, they're going to go there, um, as opposed to the place where they know they can only bank on one job. The, the interlocking of industrial fields, and this happens in Los Angeles and New York a lot, which is that the fields are, you have an ability to use and manipulate your skills in lots of different ways. Um, I think is another reason in which this happens. Um, so I think that there are mechanisms by which places, after they have gotten that edge, are able to perpetuate it. And I would, I would be interested. The counterfactual is: Do the places that get an edge and then fail not do that? Um, I think what the most interesting thing about your remark, and then I'll go to other questions, is that you're telling us that even though buzz and fashion and so forth may seem more um, subjective or uh, less material, though they're not. They seem to operate the same way Absolutely other right. entrepreneurial endeavors yes. do. And uh, you know, Schumpeter would have been glad to hear your talk. <laughs> but you know what I mean. More questions, please? Yes? I'll ask about the, the visualization. Um, so I'm assuming this is GIS. So what's the process? Like, how did you design? or think about these kind of galaxies of stars, right? What was the process for coming up with that? Because one of the things that to me is missing from this <coughs> is place, right? It's very difficult for me to see, oh, that's Manhattan. Like, what gets lost in this kind of galaxy of stars is the actual place which well. GIS <coughs> usually kind of takes you. So I'm kind of wondering about these yeah. kind of visualization. No, of course. Um, so those are, I mean, I think that that's definitely an aesthetic uh, question that there's, when Sarah and I looked at, and if you, in the paper, it's much more, so the, the, the maps in the paper are more, much more detailed and they highlight the actual location. But you know what's so interesting is these on the, on the New York Times are buzzworthy. These images yeah. Yeah. are like fantastic and they're now circulating. Even though they're really quite blurry and abstract. But I in love terms of yeah, the, I mean, they're fantastic looking. But as sort of, yeah, that design element. Well, you, you bring up, and I wish my colleague was here because she's, she's the, the she's genius of the, with, with, with the visualization part. Um, she, but, but you're right. I mean, one of the things about GIS as a technology is that on the one hand, it allows you, if you can, if you can attach a spatial attribute to 
uh, as we did in a photograph, but to anything, the real estate values, uh, census tracts, of course, and, and look at um, <coughs> all these things showing up, you get a lot of meaningful data um, that tells you a lot about place. Mm -hmm. But also the thing about GIS, particularly as it becomes more advanced, is that it, it has become an art form. The MOBA actually has events mm -hmm. where they put images like that in, but they're probably less keen on the uh, you know, on the Moran's eye results, or they're less keen on, oh, well, can you actually tell me what place you're highlighting there? So yeah. that's, I think it's one that's a very interesting and really important down. thing to point out. Yeah. yeah. Another Other questions? I wonder if there's something, you know, there might even, like, there's a coefficient, let's say, of uh, agglomeration right. that you can, yeah, you know, what, then, if you have a certain number of spaces, it doesn't quite come together in the same way. I mean, what's the tipping point, let's say, in this? And I mean, to say something like compared to New York versus uh, Los Angeles, and that way you have the fuseness of, of Los Angeles in terms of possible places where things can occur, whereas Manhattan, not, not in New York, but Manhattan in particular here. And I was thinking of something like, um, uh, like the rise of Keith Haring, uh, you know, Keith Haring, you know, Make these drawings on in, in the subway yeah. there on on ads in the subway and that's how how they started you know and so people would see that they come by in the subway and who's this guy who's doing this and how did this work you know and gradually you know he became a name and started showing in galleries and things like that so that, I mean there was enough intensity that enough of um, you know, the number of times people saw this and the, and the closeness of the space that allowed this to happen whereas if somebody did something in the subway here you know, nobody would ever see it. But you know, it's interesting what you're saying is, because I think it's, it's also true in academic work, it's one thing to be good at what you do, it's another to have a uh, sort of visible, as they say, and to have an authentic visibility. And that involves all the work of going to meetings, schmoozing up people, becoming, uh, you know, I, you know, there are John Nashes who make discoveries and then go crazy and then get a Nobel Prize because they can't give one to someone now because he did the first work, so he has to get one too. But there are very few of those. Most people work very hard at that, and if they don't, they don't thrive. So I think it's a very general set of problems. I think you have this wonderful way of thinking about it. The one question that comes to mind before we take more questions is, you've done tests to, to say whether your agglomerations are random, right? Yeah, right. that's what you do with Moran's eye. Right, all right. Cool. Uh, so two, two more types of questions. So one, one is on, uh, on monocentricity and polycentricity. So, you know, we've done work on monocentricity of cities and employment bases, right? So, LA is more polycentric. I'm just wondering whether Buzz is polycentric in LA or it's monocentric in New York. New York's sort of a classic monocentric city, older. So, I mean, whether or not you sort of thought about recasting sort of just straight urban economic terms. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, actually, they're both finitely poly polycentric in the sense that they have right. several nodes, but they don't have that many nodes. That makes sense. Well, but and I mean, this is in Manhattan. Would we, all of this is in Manhattan? So this is monocentric. Well, the important so compared thing. To the metro area. Well, the important thing, and, and you know, you're right. Those, those, as Meredith pointed out, those are more beautiful than um, informative. <laughs> as, as, as <laughs> <it's> just, <laughs> uh, uh, but um, the thing that we found in Manhattan and Los Angeles uh, is that um, in both of them, they actually exhibit very similar uh, social agglomeration capacities. Uh, and also that the industries, fashion, art, music, design, tend to be heterogeneously interacting in both. So you see a lot of uniform, uniformity in their behavior, in their social behavior. Okay. Uh, the, the thing about Manhattan, the important thing are the white, the white blobs, because yep. that's the most, uh, they're the hottest spots, so to speak. Okay, and then two other questions. So again, think about urban economics. So, um, and your parallel economic development thing is exactly right, because if you could bottle this, you know, every every city would be, you know, if you, this would be wonderful if you could try to capture this. So two questions. One is, in terms of thinking about cities, there are cities that thrived and then died. And so I'm looking for whether or not you think there are signs of a, of a turnaround. So I've been doing some work on gentrification, and my I'm looking for a leading indicator, because by the time you see house prices move, it's too late. Right. right. And I, the, I'm working on, and I think it's a an, neat an, idea, we'll see it works out, but is the number of sort of Volvos that appear in the neighborhood. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah, you can, so that's if you see, really... You can see the, the pioneers drive different cars than the natives, and so, hmm. and so once the, you look at the registry of cars in the neighborhood, and then you get, once there's this introduction of a different kind of car, the neighborhood can follow thereafter. So, right. I mean, that, and then the other, right. and on the way down, signs of down, it doesn't have to be a bull necessarily, but you know, and, uh, uh, but then on the downside, you know, Buffalo was once a great city. It was once a leading star with leading lights, and the elite lived there, and, and it's not anymore. 
and I kind of go into two, so the beginning of buzz, the end of buzz, they looked at those kind of benchmarks for either one of those things? I think, I, I think to be honest with you, and I, I'd love to hear Professor Brody's comments on this, because celebrity is the essence of this. Yeah, I sure. think buzz is implicit in it, you know it begins and ends. I, the, the thing we were very, very interested in was, can we find patterns right. that are transferable to, uh, so the next step is for us is to look at other global cities and to look at other um, years. Okay. Um, so what we hope to find is, well, the patterns stay the same, the places change. Um, you know, so the, the buzz thing definitely goes away in the way that we care about a particular artist a lot for some period of time. And it's, it's um, I think it was Louis Minad wrote in the, um, in the New Yorker, it's the difference between being talked about in restaurants and being recognized in restaurants. And I think you could say the same thing about the places. It's the difference between really wanting to be there and kind of just knowing it exists. And I think that the really wanting to be there part lasts, it's, it's, an, it's a finite um, period of time. Um, even if there's a larger sort of pattern in which these social organizations occur. Do you want to say anything about it? Well, I, you know, I think you know, that there's definitely a finite, uh, uh, and it would be interesting, uh, you remember the uh, uh, Bernard Rudofsky had this thing in Our Clothes Modern about when clothes, the kind of periodization of when clothes are fashionable, when they go out of fashion, when they come back in as yeah. retro, and all of, mm -hmm. and you can do the same thing, I think, with a lot of cultural products. Right, in that Absol way. absolutely. The disco's going to return. Oh, sir, it did, it did during my <laughs> high school. I was wearing butterfly collars. I got at the Salvation Army. <laughs> but, you know, in terms of what Martin was saying about failures, though, too, and you're saying about gentrification, I think downtown LA is an interesting yeah. thing to study because there's so many efforts to st in the last two or three decades to restart it. And it finally seems to have taken hold. But, you know, there are lots of downtimes. You know, there'd be several apartments. I'm, my wife rented a studio down there, and this is, you know, this is like 20 years ago, and it's going to be. This is going to be the new art thing, and <coughs> one other person rented a studio in the building, and fine, you know, that was the end of it. So, you know, I have just a few like random uh, comments, more than questions. First off, Chris is wrong. It's Honda Elements. Those are the leading <laughs> elements. <laughs> oh, but I was really touched by Professor Brody's uh, comment about. Um, the key issue about place, with the question of place and the key issue being about where's your audience. And audience could be on the internet, it could be on a TV show, it could be at a location. And so, you know, buzz, does buzz take place on TV shows? And specifically, is it David Letterman or Jay Leno? Or, you know, I mean, you could probably do a similar kind of analysis in the media world that's not, not you know, urban-based, but, um, how do I say it, <laughs> airwave-based. Right. Um, well, what, I, there's a great uh, article that was in, I think it was in Science two years ago, about uh, an experiment they did at Columbia called Music Lab. And what they did is they had, they controlled it, they had uh, a, tons of people logged online and they listened to music. And in um, one uh, experiment, they had them uh, just vote and have no idea what other people heard of. Right, they just made, they said, this is the song I like the most, or these are the top five, or whatever. In the other uh, uh, experiment, they had them listen to, they had them, um, before they made their decision, see what other people made. And so obviously at a certain point, I think what Professor Brody is that there's, there's a tipping point, clearly, where suddenly you're like, oh, everyone likes that song. Right. So the end result was that when you had no idea what anyone else listened to. There was a lot of chaos. I mean, there were some songs that were genuinely good and some that were genuinely bad, but generally, I mean, generally speaking, it was it was pretty chaotic. Um, when you knew what other people voted for, you saw immediate rankings. It's just like a scholarship committee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you gravitate on, on the common denominator. Well, Tal, I mean, the thing that we thought was so interesting with this work was that we were actually, the story wasn't new. The story was a story of social, economic, and industrial dynamics. I mean, this is the same story of New York, of Los Angeles, of Silicon Valley, of how we decide to go to X conference versus Y conference. That there's a, I, I, you know, maybe it's the social scientist always wanting a theory of everything. But I do think that there's a sort of, okay, well, we're talking about a social milieu, but it's still economies of scale and agglomeration. Um, and we see these patterns in lots of different fields. So. Well, economies of scale, agglomeration, and um, central place. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I was thinking that as you try to move your event further away from Hollywood, you'd be cut off by another event that was closer to Hollywood. Yep. And they would capture that buzz, and you would be in Pasadena with me. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> in the Midwest, yeah. I have a question. Um, 
um, there was this, I used to live in Washington, D.C., and the, um, the post did this kind of, I found it fascinating experiment. They had Jonathan Bell play at the Fawn Station in the morning as all these commuters were coming off the train. And they assumed that it, there were just going to be these massive hordes of people because the music was so objectively beautiful. And everyone would stop, and they and he's so famous. Of course everyone will know he had a baseball hat on or something. So he wasn't dressed in a tux or anything, but no one stopped. There were like two or three people, and they said they documented the whole thing. It was great. And it got me thinking that it's often marketing, right, that, that it causes these buzzwordsy words things. And in your study, it's kind of interesting because we don't know, I think the magic with marketing is we can't often measure who shows up, and it is the marketing effective. And in some ways, by by documenting all of this, you may you have a measure of, of people showing up because of marketing. To me, it seems like you're actually kind of measuring marketing, right? right. And and that's that's kind of different. And so can you think, is there a way now to capture the marketing that happened before the buzz, right? Like, did is it that these places distribute more pamphlets? Did they have a bigger margin, or did they did they have airtime on on radios? Were they in the TV? I mean, is it so? To me, it seems that you've captured something that is a question that why does the marketing industry work, right? I mean, I don't know. Is there a way? That, have you thought about that, or is it? Well, we we certainly uh, talk to people. Um, Getty has a, a, a series of events that they always go to. Um, again, though, I think it's interesting you use the term marketing because I would actually say that there's clearly some, uh, not sign, well, might even be a signed contract deal, but there is a deal between media and certain events and that that reinforces it. Um, I don't know if the, I mean, obviously the Oscars do market themselves more than other small events, um, but I'm not sure if it's the marketing as much as the fact that everyone um, who, everyone, it's, it's kind of a cultural stock market. Everyone who's anything, in that industry is at the Oscars. And so, of course, as the media, you want photos of them. And so this, this is, that's, the, that's the dynamic. Um, the cause and effect is, is hard to, I mean, I think in some ways it's a very pedestrian answer that the infrastructure of the Kodak Theater lends itself to it more than sort of, you know, my coffee shop in Los Feliz. You know, we're not gonna have the Oscars there. There's a certain very obviousness to the, the location. Right. But I really think it is more of not, not. I don't want to say. I guess I share information. You know who's there. They know who's going to come and take the pictures. They want to be in the pictures, and they want the pictures. So you know, then you get this perfect storm of of everyone showing up in, in one place and not another. I think there's also a protective side too. I mean, that is, that, you know, that they're. You were talking about risk, which I think is interesting. The you know, paparazzi want to risk because they're going to make more money for a right. for a candid shot than they're going to make from, from something taken at, a, at an actual event. Yeah. And yeah. By the same That's token, that the celebrities you know feel insulated yeah. at those events. Right. Is That's that the very first time the word paparazzi was used today. No. 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 Okay. I was just going to ask. It. I was just going. I was thinking. Chris is riots, right? Riots and buzz. Well, one is a paparazzi and one is a buzz. And then responding to uh, what Kate was asking, her, her example. Is buzz something about readiness? That, that you, said, you were saying people come together when they want to be photographed and when you want to see people. And paparazzi is when you, you're not ready to be, to be buzzed. And they try to ca capture you anyway. And so something about buzz is that is a perfect storm, as you said, was the, that where you bring together people who are ready. That's it. That, that, I like that. I think, you're, I think you're definitely onto something with that. That's, you're right. I mean, even if everyone you know, crowds around the photo of Britney Spears shaving her head, that's not buzz, that's just scandal. That's that's a totally, <laughs> no, but I mean, it is a totally different reaction, well, she, you're right. She's not ready for it. She's not ready, she didn't <laughs> want that picture taken, you're no. right. That's true, there's a collectiveness, there's a collective uh, situation going on with buzz versus the packs taking pictures and kind of being invasive. It's, so it's a good marketing to find people who are ready yeah. and gets them in the right spot. I'd also say there's a bureaucratic side to books that too. I mean, that's you know that it's organized yeah. in some in some basic that's way, very good. meditated in some way. So, and whereas the other ones are more happenstance, you know, you, the other ones you want to poke holes in images rather than perpetuate them. I think one of the things you want to do in your future work is indicate where your study is different from from the studies of industrial structure and entrepreneurship and development, and where they, in some sense. Uh, articulations and developments of, this, of the line. Because I don't know if there's much difference here. Right. And, what's, and if that's true, what's fascinating is because academics say, well, no, good work thrives and bad work doesn't. And you're saying, it's not so simple. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
Or you could say only good people get buzz and bad people don't, and no one believes that. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but so it's a very nice problem to ask yourself how much your study applies uh, more generally. You know, is how much of it is a extension of the standard set of ideas that you teach in, in uh, Econ Development 101 and where the surprises are. That's, I thank you, Mark. And I, that would help me know, you know, and I'm perfectly willing for you to say to me, no, it's the same story. And I would be sort of happy. But, you know, that's just, <laughs> no, no, because, because what it says to me is, you think one th we, manufacture, you know, we manufacture cars and we talk about insubstantial reputational things and you think they're different, ha. And that would be a really interesting discovery. More questions? Yes. I just wanted to say uh, about the, how you were saying that I think you think that place is now more important than ever in light of the internet and everything. Well, I, is, I, I worked at a museum and people would come in and kind of question the idea of docu documenting collections and putting them online, wondering if we weren't somehow undercutting our potential for audience development because those images were now online and you could see the image and then you were good. But in fact, seeing an image online and then going and seeing it the second time in an authentic, real moment makes that second experience that much richer. And I think that's what happens <coughs> when people take a picture of a place or a city and they say it on Flickr maybe a thousand times. I mean, because people always take the same pictures from the same vantages. If you uh, Google Takashita Street, you will see it from the Harajuku station line entrance over and over. It's great. So when people go there, they feel that more fully. And um, I was wondering if you've had any conversations with people about that or if that was intentional, you know, the red carpet idea. Well, you bring up something very important, which I think Professor Rohde uh, spoke of in his, in his comments, which is the idea of Hollywood. Um, that in some ways it's very, uh, I mean, if you talk to an average New Yorker or Angelino, they're not saying Hollywood and Vine and Times Square are their places to be. But that is what the world thinks. And there is an identity that we create through, through images. And it is the identity of which the people who flock to these places, um, the tourists who are very economically meaningful for us, um, the way in which these places are written up, um, that it is an identity that we construct through images, and it, it's, I, it, it's, I don't even want to call it a simulacrum. I think it's, it's just, it, it may be very different from our experience as living here, but it doesn't, it doesn't take away from the fact that people still really want to come here. And they may come to uh, Los Angeles and say, well, actually, I'd like to spend time in Venice Beach, or if you come to New York, well, actually, I'd just like to wander on the Lower East Side. And that might be New York, but that's not the reason that the person from Kansas necessarily came. You know, they saw the picture of Times Square and they said, I want to be there. So I think your point is very, very right on. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, like the first time you go to Paris, you might think you're boring to see the Eiffel Tower, but you still want to go yeah. see the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, you decided in the first place. You have to do the things. Right. Um, well, I want to thank both Elizabeth and Leo for uh, this interesting conversation. Yeah. I think it's very provocative because it does touch upon both cultural and economic issues. And I don't mean by economy of culture or the culture of economy, I mean they're really distinct issues. And uh, thank you all for coming and asking questions. Uh, and we really appreciate it. So thank you very much.